Don't get yourself in the lot. So, the way this talk came about is actually we did some work about five months ago with our internal development team about dry. And one of the things that we found was that dry is something that people can explain or understand, but it's actually quite hard to put in in real life. So I'm going to talk about is four things, five things that we did that kind of adhere to the dry principle. Once again, um, so the first thing I'm going to look is actually the principle. So we're going to look at three sources. Wikipedia, the original book that described Drive, which was the programmatic, uh, pragmatic program, not programmatic. And then there's my paraphrasing of it. If you read the Wikipedia version, you get a bunch of things like avoid uh, repetition by using data normalization and all that sort of stuff, which really doesn't mean much unless you do things that I do, which is thinking about how to write software differently. So let's forget about that definition. The definition I like the most actually comes from the original book, so The Pragmatic Programmer. And what it says is that every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation of in the system. And that's what they call dry. Which, once again, doesn't really, really mean anything. Um, it's quite hard to apply. But what I did like about that book is in the next section, it actually talks about how this duplication arises. And this is one of those things that really helped me to understand how to prevent it by understanding how it actually happens. So there's things like imposing duplication, which means that developers are like, we have to write new code because nothing exists. That's a Google problem. Um, from my experience, almost every problem has something in it, and if you come across something that's so unique, um, you're probably onto a winner. Mm -hmm. In the very duplication, um, developers may not mind there's a better way. Impatient, um, there's time frames. We're just going to knock it together and refactor it later. And the thing I was facing the most actually is inter developer duplication. And this happens in some industries more than others because we may have subject matter ex experts, people who know their things. They have to transfer over that knowledge to us. We have to write the code, then we have to ship that code. And that happens in certain things, in certain industries, um, and especially in the industry I was working on. For me, being dry is not about reusing code. I think reusing, and that's where a lot of developers get confused. Um, you know, dry is about just writing code. For me, it's four key things. It's not writing different code to solve the same problem. So a common problem that almost every software development house has is making HTTP calls. Every time a junior developer, a senior developer, or a mid-developer writes an HTTP call framework, that's repetition. The second type is adding new things to solve a problem we've already solved. We know how to store documents in a document database, let's not get another one. So this happens quite a bit. Uh, efficient communication to what really work, and solving problems in such a fundamental way that we can actually build on top of it and reuse it. So not having a point solution just to solve that problem, which we can't actually expand. One of the key things you'll notice is this is not just about programmers, it's not just about developers, this is about the entire team. And this is why the four and five use cases I'm talking about actually go across the teams, not only just about the developers. Because developers are only as good as what people tell them. So let's use an example from experience, an integration engine company. I use this example for two reasons. One is I work for one, and two is because I'm working on one. <laughs> so essentially, our company is going to solve integration challenges. We're going to use flow-based programming, and we're going to call develop components called plugins or extensions that will do the various bits and pieces. We know that 80% of the things we develop will get used in production as soon as they're shipped. So this is why drive is really important for us, and you'll see the, the, um, the file on the bit later. And we create flows which use these components. So we kind of wire these things together. So a competitor of ours, no grid or an open source project, we can see which implication happens. So this is a plugin for talking to Microsoft SQL. And there's 10 different types. If you read the briefings, you don't know what the difference is. And this is duplication in the wild. So this is, happens quite common. This is not just you know, something we make up. If we're not careful, we may have 10 different bits doing exactly the same thing, which is talk to Microsoft SQL Server. So here's our process. A subject matter expert talks to us and he goes, hey, I want to integrate with the system. The developer then develops it, he tests it within his own system, and he chucks it away. Then he goes to QA, QA spins up their own version of that uh, system. They do the QA work, they chuck it away. The next is the customer engineer has to do the same thing. 
and the third thing is the customer. So if you actually go and do the maths, combine the 16 hours of beef with 12 hours of which are duplicated. And I know that can be a little bit tough, so I drew some pictures. <laughs> so here's, here's us trying to get to the goal of developing something our customer can use. The dev set up the system, it's all good, great. QA, he's got to run some tests, he passes it fairly quickly. Me as the subject matter expert and the front facing engineer, we don't have access to those systems, so we have to rebuild that in production, we have to rebuild those demos in production for the customer. And if we don't have documented well, the customer's never a good experience. I think a lot of you guys probably have seen something like this. Worked in dev, ops problem now. And this is actually quite problematic because we don't get paid to write code because we like it, we get paid to write code because customers need to use it. So one of the best things that we did in my last job was actually do something like this. We made what we call the universal pipeline. So every time we design something, everybody used the same pipeline. What that gave us is the ability to trace back how the developers configured the test systems, how the QA passed the tests, to help the documentation guys do that thing, and it actually adhered to drive because we could all look at the same thing, we could all see it through the same eyes, and especially with remote teams, it really, really helps. So rather than us doing something like this where everybody was building their own version and trying to test things, we had one version that was, we are working on feature XYZ. If you want to see how the feature works, go to that pipeline refer to the pipeline, document of the pipeline. So this is actually quite a good thing to think about. It's not always possible in every uh, application, but it was something that really, really helped us because it reduced the number of times we had to touch something, and it meant we could ship faster. The second biggest thing I think that keeping dry really, this can be really difficult, is library selection. If you go look at any protocol, there's at least 10 libraries to do certain things, and you can spend a lot of time one of two things. One is different developers using different libraries and having to deal with those works. And the second is basically everybody in their own So this can actually be tricky. So this is the system we came up with for evaluating libraries. If the vendor we were working with had a Node.js library, we used that library. Because the vendor would support it and things like that. If we had to write our own libraries, we made sure we wrote core libraries only once and reused those components. So we built other things on top of it. If we had to use third-party libraries to evaluate three things, really like promise-based libraries. So if there was a library that was promise-based versus a library that wasn't promise-based, we'd go for the promise-based library because it simplified a lot of things. If we had good documentation, verbose error logging is really, really good, and functionality well separated. In reality, we couldn't always go down to one library. As much as we tried to say everybody use Axios, and that was my preferred library for HTTP calls, there are some things that Axios doesn't do that we needed to use rest of, rest, the REST library for. And sometimes the reality of situations, you may end up using two libraries, but rather than every developer using their own library, I think you should standardize in two libraries. There are times when there are libraries, there's lots of good libraries, and this is the second lesson I learned, because you can't always be dry, because there are lots of SOAP libraries, but what we were doing, they actually didn't adhere to, because the people who wrote them just wrote them quickly, and we couldn't integrate with the system. So we actually had to go and write our own library. So just because you have to write your own library doesn't mean you're not trying. As long as you can do your research and say, the libraries I've been trying to look at don't deliver what I want, so I am writing this library for a reason. And I think that adheres to the dry principle. Code style with promises, so you won't be able to see with uh, much of that, but one of the challenges we really had was callback help. For those of you who do JavaScript programming with mm -hmm. this. It was very hard to troubleshoot errors and was very hard to add more functionality because we want to do incremental development. We want to go and ship something quick and do incremental development. What I really found great with promises is that we could actually put things into blocks and then just have chain the promises together, which gives a really, really nice and readable flow of our program. It makes it easier for us to augment our functionality because we can go to a specific part in the program and just change that. Um, and what we came down to actually is we figured out that each extension that we were programming needs to do five things. They need to verify the configurations, react to data coming in, validate the data, throw some meaningful errors if things are wrong, and tear down services if we need it. So what we ended up doing was writing something like this. And if you read that, you'll see the first bit of that code is validation. The second bit kicks off the promise chain, and at the end, we've got things like the finally and the catch, and all our error logging was in the catch statement, so if we want to be more verbose with our errors, any developer that, if I said, hey guys, we need some more verbose errors, 
a developer that speaks in that, even if he didn't write it, knows that he goes right down to the catch statement because that's where all the errors will be um, bottled up. And he could either <coughs> use certain error codes or change things. And that made code a lot more readable because we knew that if we were working in a certain section of the code, then we would go out to a particular section. And maybe that, hey, the validations are too tough. Go to the beginning of the code, remove some of the validations. Rather than this callback sort of thing where you had to go, oh, this calls this, this calls this, things like that. So I think promises help with code style, but also helps keeping things dry because if you know how the program's going to flow and everybody writes the programs in the same way, and promises do force you to do it in a certain way, the, 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 though they're a bit harder, you adhere to dry because you're not, you're not, you're not reinventing how the program will flow each time. You are kind of putting things in the right place. Um, the, the next thing that I'll talk about is actually putting useful things into core SDKs or solution stacks. Useful things are observability. So if you're using something like Prometheus, put that right down. Don't make developers write their own Prometheus metrics. Put it down somewhere down the bottom, so at least you're getting some metrics. Uh, what you'll find is that if you don't have observability, uh, so I differentiate observability versus logging in that observability is you're looking for certain things. What you'll find is you have a problem, you won't be able to detect it, you have to go back. Whereas if you have to have observability as part of the core tech stack, then it's a lot easier. Log shipping, uh, connectivity to backend systems, I think that's probably the hardest one because if you abstract it away from junior developers especially, you can actually save yourself a lot of headaches because um, the junior developers don't think about things like, hey, it's a cluster or I shouldn't run long running queries. If you can go and abstract it all the way and get your senior guys to do that, you're very dry and you're not having to teach every new engineer. As they get more mature, they can go and learn about that. So that's what I mean by put the useful things somewhere where people won't have to think about them, and when if you want to touch them, you can go and ship them out. Um, and this is the last bit, which is more of a process thing. Um, I think I've been to sort of companies where you go there and there's 13 languages and there's 12 databases and everything's everywhere, and you go and get them to sit down and draw out how everything talks, and then people understand why developers can't actually do the job. Because not only do developers have to uh, do lots of languages, they have to maintain lots of systems, and when something breaks, it takes a long time to find. No matter how good your instrumentation is, it can take a long time to find. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, quite well is we want to do um, automated tests with UI, and Selenium obviously becomes a choice, natural choice for that. But we actually forced our QA guys to write a Nightwatch, JS, or WebDriver, because those are JavaScript frameworks we could get developers to help them. We didn't have to learn a new language. And when, you're not always going to be able to do this, but if you can, when you're thinking about how you're going to write things, use components you have as much as you can. Don't put yet another document database just because it's maybe 10% faster. Don't you know, bring yet another tool. Because that's the fewer languages you have, the fewer stacks you have, the easier it's going to be, and the better you're going to get. Uh, the bottom of it is kind of food for thought. Uh, I think the most common thing I see with Drive, the reason why I see Drive failing, is that people think it's just a developer responsibility. I think it's a full team responsibility. So it's everybody from DevOps, it's everybody from product management, because if we all think about it together, we can do, we can release things quite quickly. Um, I've been programming for about 10 years, and I think the current state that we're in probably makes Drive very easy. So if you think about things like Docker, think about things like Fluent D, and all those other tools that we have, and I've got them some at the bottom, uh, Cloud Native Foundation, it's a lot easier to do this now than it was sort of with archaic applications sort of 10 years ago. Um, don't forget tools don't fix problems, people do. So the right application of tools is what fixes problems, not just the tools. Putting Prometheus in your environment isn't going to fix it unless you think about how it's going to be bridged. Um, there's two books that I think really helped me understand some of this stuff. The Pro uh, Pragmatic Programmer, which if you Google, uh, you'll find a free copy. I'm going to paste the link. <laughs> Um, and 90 things, 97 things every programmer should know. Um, so if you go to Lean Pub, there's a free version or you can donate if you want. And the last thing really to think about, which is what I really want to everybody take away, it's really easy to th make things complicated. Um, it's really easy to write code that uses the same components and so like that. The real key to staying dry and having these sort of really, really productive frameworks or productive engines, whatever you call it, is really trying to make the complicated simple. So when somebody comes to you and says, hey, we want to do this, okay, we're going to make a document DB, you know, MongoDB version of that, and that's how we're going to do it. Rather than going, hey, let's go off and find yet another thing that, that's interesting. And that's really what Drive is about. And you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, but really, 
try to try to think about how you can stop adding things to your code, but also how you can stop adding things to your infrastructure to solve problems you may have written yourself. Right. Any questions? Excellent. Um, oh, cool. Excellent. That was amazing. Uh, wow. Also, I just want to add those two books that you recommended. I read them uh, very early on in my career, and they're absolutely fantastic and still relevant to this day. I, I think um, what you basically said is how to do repeat yourself and what not to do. And um, I think it's a very good formulation, and you've given some good guidelines and tools and so forth. So everybody should go and actually do repeat themselves in the manner that you have um, dictated there. Yeah, oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Where do you work? Uh, so currently I work at Rockwell uh, Automation, so I do software development for them. Uh, but previously I worked at a company called Rico, which is actually a recent startup, and they basically wrote an integration engine from scratch. Um, and that's that's part of the advantages that I have, that um, I work for a company that's basically a startup and, we, we could do some of the stuff. I understand that some people come into a company that's been there for a long time and there's a lot of things going on that may not be as possible. But we spend a lot of time thinking in fish, when we're doing fish engineering. We spend a lot of time going, no, we're not going to put this new thing in. We're going to just, you know, this thing may not be the top notch, top of the line. But if it does 80% of the things and it's, we're using what we've got and we don't have to go write new things, then it's great. And that's, that's what all this sort of thing came from. Um, one of the first things I had to deal with at one of my jobs was the back end used to send us an error saying, is error, colon, true, <laughs> and now go off and you know, find out what that actually means. So when you had that slide up about you know actually meaningful errors, that's very important. 